Well, awesome. I'd like to thank you for allowing me into your homes for this third episode of Season 5 of Esoteric Science Roundtable. I would like to uh, begin with a few announcements to begin the show today. Uh, the first thing I would like to mention is the upcoming metaphysical philosophical meeting that we here at Esoteric Science Roundtable, in conjunction with Jeff Contreras from Therefore I Am, uh, co-host each and every third Wednesday of the month, and for this particular month of February, this happens to be falling on February the 21st, and we meet at Spider House, which is close to 29th in Guadalupe. Uh, we meet uh, from about 8 p.m. till when people decide to leave, and uh, again, very informal, very casual, and we encourage anyone that's uh, interested in the topics that we cover on the show to come down and have a chat with us, look for myself, Jeff, uh, and oftentimes more often than not, you'll find Freeman down there as well, uh, helping to uh, break bread with people and uh, share a little bit of his perspective with the people that, that uh, make the meetings. And so again, we encourage people to come on down to the metaphysical meetings uh, and gather with us, gather with like-minded, metaphysically and philosophically inclined people and uh, chat about whatever is on your mind or just uh, enjoy the conversation. Uh, it's up to you. So please uh, consider coming down. Uh, one next thing I would like to mention there is an event that is taking place next Thursday, which is the 22nd. Uh, this event will be taking place at the Unity Church uh, on Grover Avenue here in Austin. Uh, this is in central Austin. And this is actually going to be taking place during the live show, uh, this live show broadcast next Thursday on the 22nd, uh, starting at 7 p.m. But I really do encourage people to forego this show, for, you know, maybe tape it or what have you. I would encourage people to make every effort to head down to this Unity Church function to support Kevin Barnett. He's uh, from the University of Wisconsin, and he's one of the 911 Scholars for Truth. Uh, this is a, an event that's being put on for Austin citizens for 911 Truth, and uh, more for information can be gleaned about this at ac911t.org. And I want to thank the, that group for the efforts that they've. Uh, their efforts in putting out information about 911 here locally and gathering, uh, meeting, meeting and different functions and gathering uh, with like-minded people to help again bring out this information about 911. Uh, I want to also mention quickly, uh, some of you may have caught Freeman on the Jack Blood show. He was on yesterday for the tail end of the show and he was on for about uh, maybe 15 minutes or so and it was really refreshing to hear uh, Freeman's perspective uh, and also, you know, it was good to hear him on, uh, on the radio broadcast and hear him getting out to a large audience and bringing out uh, some ideas of consciousness and awareness and the ideas of the one humanity, which he's so uh, well known for. And I do thank him and Jack Blood for allowing him to have that forum and speak about these ideas about sharing exchange and, again, uh, consciousness, awareness, and what the one humanity. <coughs> Excuse me. So I would like, at this point, I'd like to uh, mention a local magazine. And this is a magazine that uh, a woman here in North Central Austin puts together. This is a magazine called Clip Tart. And I'll show the cover of the most recent Clip Tart. We've got a close up here as well. This is a very fascinating magazine. Uh, it does feature a lot of clipped art, clip, uh, cut and paste type art. There's a back cover as well. There's a, there's a, a plethora of interesting little uh, quips, quotes, and things of that nature in here. There's another cut and paste gem inside. And uh, this it's very much rooted in, uh, let me actually show quickly this. This is another version of the previous Clip Tart, Clip Tart 3 from last year. So this, we're currently in the fourth edition. That's the last I'm going to show, actually, of that. So we can go back to the other camera angle. Uh, there are a couple of quotes that I want to borrow from this. This is, again, a great magazine that this lo local woman named Susan Boren puts together. And uh, there was a quick quote in here somewhere that I wanted to, to borrow from. Oh, here's one I'll offer out quickly. The vermin want to teach us something. Karl Kopeck, War with the Newts. And uh, there are a series of these little esoteric and occult gems scattered all throughout this entire magazine. And there's an interesting article in the, the most current uh, clip tart, which is called The Weird Women. 
and this is by Claire LeVay, and this speaks about a lot of esoteric words that uh, those familiar with this show and uh, Jeff's show and I suppose Freeman's show as well might recognize, such as, uh, well, certainly Scientology, EST, Golden Dawn, Crowley's Magical Principles, the Rosicrucian Order, uh, the Odinist Society, and then just uh, among others. And this also mentions the hum Humanities Resource Center, the HRC at UT, and some of Crowley's hand-drawn cartoons and other works that are available there uh, that Freeman has uh, brought to light on his show as well. So again, a really wonderful magazine that is done here locally, and I encourage people, uh, if they have more, uh, if they have an interest in finding out more about this, that they could uh, Google Clip Tart, again, C-L-I-P-T-A-R-T, Clip Tart, and they might be able to speak to the Clip Tart herself. And, uh, let her know how you enjoy her magazine or some thoughts you may want to share with her. Okay, so I would like to go ahead and get into the show proper now. Uh, this particular show, I want to discuss the fire of mind. This concept is related to our self-conscious unfolding throughout time from a point when animal man, so-called, or, or what we would likely consider of as the caveman <laughs> The caveman part of our human evolution. That's a bit unusual. I'm not sure what's going on here with the audio, but uh, uh, nonetheless, this uh, the, what we might be uh, familiar with what's the, the caveman era days. And so, roughly about 18 million years ago, according to the esoteric tradition. And certainly contemporary science doesn't really even acknowledge that there were these animal men, so-called, or these cavemen, uh, really in effect at that point in time. But nonetheless, this is uh, something to take as a point of consideration in considering this philosophy. And certainly a lot of this has to be taken as speculation because 18 million years ago was a long time ago, and we don't really have written records to corroborate what's being alleged about this particular time. So if indeed there was a point where this self-conscious animal man, our humanity on the planet at the time, did merge with or, or meld with the component of mind, it can be considered in a symbolic sense. And this is uh, the ideas that are laid out in the esoteric science in relation to how this unfolded. The, sim the symbolic story goes like this, essentially, that there were these lords of flame, so-called, from the planet Venus, and that these Venusian extracosmic influences ma made their way to our planet Earth, and that they merged with the existing humanity on the planet. Again, the fire of mind had not was not uh, born. It wasn't even really latent at this point in our early humanity but it became enacted and began to unfold after this process took place. And so again, this is a symbolic way to describe a situation in which a higher spiritual essence merged with our humanity in order to in, uh, in light, uh, excuse me, to lighten or light rather the fires of mind within our uh, humanity and for this process to begin unfolding throughout time within our humanity. And this is a large portion of the purpose for our being on the planet uh, initially is that we are here as vehicles to provide for the unfolding of consciousness, to provide for the unfolding of mind with, within this planet. And so as we begin to work with the systems that allow this to take place, we can gain a tremendous amount. And uh, this is also why it helps to, to consider these symbolic stories and to understand how this also gives us uh, an indication as to the future of the quality of mind as it emerges in our human consciousness and how we collectively as a planet benefit from the quality of mind becoming more and more manifest within, again, the human condition. So again, thinking, self uh, thinking symbolically rather about this subconscious merging that this essence did indeed merge with our human condition. Now, there are certain, there's certainly the story of the Luciferic influence and the fallen angels and that there were allegedly these angels, these fallen angels, that came into humanity and merged with humanity. And this is the idea of the tree of good and evil 
And this is where we get the idea of original sin as well, and that this merging, this, this, this is a temptation that took place that uh, coerced early man into finding his way into, uh, into a means of, of basically working, out the, working the mind out in our manifestation. And so this, this uh, early symbolism is usually referred to, is usually uh, put out in a bad light for the most part, in that this was evil merging with our humanity. But there's certainly another way to look at it, and that this Luciferic influence, this early influence, as it did merge with humanity, also uh, it did give us our intellect and it allowed for us to, um, to again have, uh, have the this, this self-consciousness take place. There are certainly a lot of uh, different other symbols from early, especially the Bible in particular, that uh, relate back to burning and fire and things of that nature. And just to borrow from the few, there's a saying in the Bible, our God is a consuming fire. And there was also the burning bush that uh, appeared in the Bible in a couple of places. And so this concept of God as fire or this concept of, of God as perfect fire is not new. This has been revisited uh, numbers of times in the Bible previously. Also, another thing that, that we find quite common and often is the snake symbolism. And again, this ties back to the temptation in the garden that initially uh, this is what uh, caused mankind to stray from the ways of God, is that allegedly this snake came and tempted Eve, and this is the beginning of our demise, ultimately, according to that interpretation of that tradition. But this snake symbolism is uh, borrowed uh, for a lot and is also uh, mostly considered in a neg negative connotation. The concept, or the symbol rather, of the snake swallowing its tail is very common. It's also part of the logo for the Theosophical Society. But this, this snake, uh, the snake eating its tail in this, in this circle pattern is both a symbol of regeneration and a symbol of terrestrial wisdom, or the esoteric wisdom made manifest for mankind. And so this, this symbol, again, is dual in that sense. But the idea that, that there's a, this regeneration and the snake, the shedding of the skin of the snake, uh, and that recurring process also ties into this as well. But uh, the idea of the snake as wisdom has been really misapplied and misconstrued throughout time quite a bit. Uh, to say that those that consider this Luciferic influence in a more pragmatic or scientific sense, uh, to say that these individuals are serpent worshipers or Luciferic worshipers, you know, right off the bat, I think is a definite mistake and a fallacy as well. It's more so understanding these great mysteries that have been provided and passed down throughout these esoteric teachings from time immemorial that allow us to gain a little insight into what these symbols may actually mean. And so we, uh, throughout the ages, there have been those that have, been, that have provided for this emerging of thought uh, throughout time. And I, I want to use a, qu a quote quickly that I have used in the past that really applies as well. And this is from Ralph Waldo Emerson. And his quote is, great men are they who see that spiritual is stronger than any material force, that thoughts rule the world. And so, again, this idea that thought is the underlying component that is, it's the real causative factor for our manifestation. And this is why it's also been important for the teachers of those are the teachers behind the, that, that work behind the scenes for the benefit of the race, in addition to those that have worked behind the scenes primarily to subjugate and oppress human mental unfolding, both have a, de a definite interest in keeping these esoteric ideas about our consciousness and about the quality of mind emerging and uh, the, the serpent technology, or excuse me, not technology, uh, perhaps that is part of it as well. Uh, the uh, serpent symbology, rather, 
and the, the fire symbology that more often than not, when we think of, again, serpents and fire, the connotations are of negative, negative things, bad things. And again, this is not to say that people that look at these things in a scientific way uh, are worshiping these concepts by any stretch. But it gives us, uh, we, claim, we glean a greater, greater insight, is my estimation. And so <clears throat> we can't consider that the intellect of humanity has been imported, imported from an, another planet, and this again referring to Venus. Venus is interesting in the, in the, um, the fact that astronomically, it spins backwards on its axis. It spins in a retrograde fashion to the other planets. And it, this is a very curious condition, and there isn't really a, a, a real definitive scientific answer as to why Venus spins backwards. Venus is known as our counter, uh, as our counter personality, as our uh, alter ego. That's the term I was looking for. Venus is known as our, uh, as our alter, alter ego. The relationship between the Earth and Venus is such that just in our humanity, our human physical nature, we have the, the physical makeup and our personality. Our personality nature, that is how we think and act and feel. And then we have our soul nature. And this, these two are melded together and make the entire human, the whole human. Uh, well, certainly there's a spiritual aspect as well, but considering us from a duality or a polarity, then uh, we, we think in terms of soul and the nature of the soul and the physical nature. And so this, this merging together, this, this, uh, this relationship is very much akin to what takes place with Venus and the Earth in that there's this relationship. Venus is akin to our soul nature. And uh, it's a more evolved, if you will, planet than is our Earth. But they still have a very intimate uh, correspondence and, and intimate ties to one another. And so the evolution of the quality of mind on our planet is imported from Venus and is intimately tied in with the evolution of what takes place on Venus as well. Now certainly the other planets tie into our Earth unfolding at various levels also. Everything is interconnected. There's, there's no, nothing is existing in a vacuum. So all things are energetically tied and interrelated at some level. But there are some closer affinities that we can consider. And certainly Earth and, um, Earth and Venus are two of these that are very closely akin. And if we consider the idea of those teachers that work behind the scenes to help the race, the, the term, the general term for that, or the a generic term for them would be the hierarchy, the masters of wisdom, Christ and the church invisible. And those are the souls, the more evolved so, souls who are charged with, are given the responsibility of being custodians of this quality of mind as it emerges within humanity. And so initially, the first influx of this, th these also, these are human, souls as well, but again, more advanced than our average human person. And so they again, have this responsibility to watch and guide over us. Um, and the first portion of our planetary existence in which we did gain self-consciousness, this is known commonly in esoteric uh, parlance as the Lemurian age, the, the, uh, the, the great continent of Lemuria, sometimes known as Mu, M-U as well, and this is where the fire of mind first came into, again, our, our animal human condition and merged with it. And there was a yoga made available for the humanity of that time. Now certainly all, the bulk of humanity, just as it is now, there are, there are varying levels of spiritual unfoldment at any given time amongst the existing population of the planet. And so this is the same as it was in these earlier days of humanity as well in that the more advanced were given uh, this information regarding this yoga, this union, yoga meaning union. The first yoga that was introduced to humanity was called Hatha Yoga, which is still actually existing today and is still practiced today. It is uh, the most ancient form of yoga. And this is the form of yoga that allows our aspect of mind to control and manipulate the physical body. And so the very first effort or endeavor that was given to humanity as far as esoteric instruction 
was a form of yoga that was employed to use the quality of mind, very new, very, you know, very young in humanity at this time, but it's slowly emerging, and that this was really all we could muster at the time was the ability to use everything we had as far as mental cognitive facilities to just control the physical nature and to slowly master our ability to move within the physical vehicle. This was the major gain for the most evolved individuals at the time. Granted, this is something that has to be taken as a speculative theory considering the vast age in which we're talking in relation to you know, our current humanity. And so various forms of yoga became available. Then, uh, well, let's go next to the Atlantean age. The great Atlantean continent also had its own form of yoga that was a continuation of the unfolding of mind that was right and proper for this particular group of individuals. And so this unfolding of mind during the Atlantean days was tied to the way in which the quality of mind could be elicited or employed to control and bring into manifestation our emotional nature. And so the quality of desire became manipulated through a particular form of yoga called bhakti yoga, which is a devotional yoga. And this as well is still available. There still is this, this so-called bhakti yoga that you can still uh, make act, make, uh, yourself, avail yourself of and have access to. This bhakti yoga is again an emotional yoga. And so the energies of the fire of mind were employed to take what was already accomplished through the Hatha Yoga and add to it and culminate, add, add to this cumulative process with the emotional nature. And so we're building in our emotional nature, or we're building in the mental nature rather, by perfecting other qualities. Applying the mind to perfect the human vehicle so that it can be a more perfect, a perfect more perfect vessel for our mind to come through and, and, um, and work. And so as we consider the Atlantean age, this is a time of great conflict according to the esoteric tradition in which there was a huge war towards the ending of the Atlantean continent which was destroyed by water in which there was a division between these teachers that were helping us behind the scenes. This behind the scenes notion uh, is more of a current modern condition. In previous times, according to the esoteric tradition, these masters, so-called, were functioning and performing openly among men. And so they were the teachers and the priest class and those that were uh, the custodians, again, of this esoteric information that were working hand in hand with huma the humanity of the time. Uh, there, be there became, there came to a point, rather, where there was a great rift in the way in which the, uh, the teachings and the care and the nurturing of our humanity and the way it should go, there was, there was again a, a, a rift in the decision-making process. And so the uh, factions split in this group and there, be, there was a great war that was waged between this White Lodge so-called and the Black Lodge so-called keeping in mind that these, these color distinctions refer simply to the intent. When we think of white, or white lodge, white magic, this means pure, good, and certainly the, you know, the color symbolism is applicable. The black lodge being the negative, materialistic, self-centered, controlling aspect of, of those higher energies that work behind the scenes to manipulate our humanity. And so we can think of the helping and the hindering, and that this is now has found its way mostly to the behind the scenes playing out, but that there was a point in time when there was this open battle waging on the physical plane between these two factions. And so ultimately what took place was a waging of war between two types of fire. The fire employed by the White Lodge, so-called, is the fire of mind which is characterized or conditioned by pure reason and unconditional 
perfect love. The pure reason component is, is, is a, it's a component of uh, thinking in a fashion that again is all inclusive. And so the highest and best good for the human race is, is certainly factored in at this level of, of unfolding, at this level of, of evolution. But nonetheless, we still, as a, a race working through polarity, working through duality, uh, working through this interplay of soul and matter or spirit and matter, still need the component or the, the energetic faction, the consciousness that drags us down into the material nature and keeps us still held in and held back with our desire for material goods, material gain, and our own selfish interest. And so this desire mind, which is a, an aspect of the emotional nature ultimately, so this is a bit of a, a paradox or a, it may be a bit difficult to completely to uh, ascertain how that is entirely that we're discussing desire mind as an aspect of the emotional nature. But uh, nonetheless, this, this lower tier thinking, if you will, this, again, this desire, and there's a fine line between desire as being an emotional component or emotional quality and being something that we mentally want to, to, want to draw into our experience. So again, desire is, is very much a, a paradoxical term, especially when it comes to esoteric ideas. But nonetheless, the fire of mind and the, the, the idea of the quality of Buddha, Buddha, the Buddhic quality, which again is pure reason, unconditional love, it's, it's also, um, the buddhic quality is also, uh, well, it, it's a higher quality than this, this, call, this causal quality of mind. And so we see that, uh, that we're, we, we're employing higher forces as this, uh, as this battle is waged out uh, between these two factions. And so this lower material form of magic, this more antiquated form of magic that's still employed by those that wish to enslave us and control humanity and control affairs behind the scenes, uh, they still use this desire nature-based magic and this idea of kama manas, that's the eastern term, it means desire mind, manas meaning mind and kama meaning desire, <clears throat> that there's still this waging of war, this, this uh, fire versus fire, this fight fire with fire mentality that's still is employed <coughs> more so behind the scenes, but but nonetheless, this uh, it, it still is waging and still is a, a very heated contest that uh, takes place, and so uh, we can consider how yoga has still moved forward in our human uh, condition, and there has been a, there's an entirely different form of yoga that's currently available, which is called Agni Yoga. And this Agni Yoga is also known as the Yoga of Fire or the Yoga of Synthesis. And this is, this is a, uh, what can be considered a scientific means by which to unite our will with the will of the Father. And so uh, this is a very, um, it's, it's, a, it's reasonably new in relation to humanity being able to partake of it. And so um, the, the the, the number of humans that are going to come in contact with the Agni Yoga or, or be proponents of it and want to use it uh, is still going to be relatively slim in relation to the six billion plus on the planet, but it, it, <coughs> it is emerging slowly. And, uh, and the understanding of this quality of fire as it relates to mind, as it relates at its lowest levels to our desire nature, uh, still continues to be a, uh, a mystery that is uh, that our, our humanity is seeking to unravel at various levels. And so this emerging nature of fire is something that some choose to intelligently wield and to use to their benefit. The idea that fire can synthesize, that we can use this, me this means of fire to create a sort of a vacuum, if you will, an alignment, a column of fire within ourselves that allows our lower will to merge with the larger will of God. This, so this is the synthetic aspect of fire. Fire also 
destroys, and this is something that uh, we are for very well aware of from the physical plane as well. And the destruction by fire can also be applied to the qualities within our physical nature that are no longer desirable, or uh, the, the, thing, the things that we want to get rid of, we apply fire to in this esoteric sense, and we burn out the dross, we burn out the lower in inclinations and the lower material desires. So we consume this in this fire willfully and synthesize the essence of ourselves with, again, this higher, higher will, this higher fire, if you will. And so um, this, this is, uh, again, part of this process that we can uh, take advantage of if we so choose. Um, this information is, is not hidden, it's available. But um, certainly, again, as I said earlier, ideas of fire and ideas about the serpent symbolism is more often than not going to be painted in, with negative connotations and put in a negative light. And uh, this is for good reason that the church powers and those that seek to control humanity and seek to control what plays out in our consciousness and our evolution that they have a, a stake in keeping these symbols and these symbol sets, keep keeping the real meaning hidden and keeping uh, a distorted meaning in place. And so if we automatically see these things and we think, oh, this is bad, then um, we're going we're gonna to turn and run the other way without even trying to think through rationally. And so rational thought is the key to this whole thing. And there is part of this science, of this Agni Yoga science, there is a term called the Antakarana. And this is a, a bridge of synthesis built by this fire. So this vacuous, vacuous condition that I spoke of earlier is, is a process that can be reapplied and reestablished. And we, we literally build within ourselves, from our etheric, our energy body, to the will aspect of God, we build a bridge of refined, fiery fiber. And so we can climb this bridge. We can, this, this, fi this fiery fiber is very, very sturdy. It's uh, something that uh, is very resilient. And we can, once we build into it and build it from ourselves, uh, it's something that remains intact, remains a part of ourselves. And so we can refer back to it and we can pick up where we last left off. It's also like weaving or looming with light substance or with, with fire, with the essence of fire that we are building esoterically, symbolically by this process, aligning ourselves purposely, our will with the larger will. Uh, as more individuals on the planet do this, then we as humanity become more akin to the brain cells in the human brain that are the enacted active cells that science points to that are part of the brain that are thinking, be, the s brain cells that are being used, in other words. The s certainly, the most are aware that science has pointed out to the fact that the largest, largest portion of the brain is dormant. The cells are dormant. They don't, for all intents and purposes, they don't seem to be having any real function. But there is a portion of it, of the brain, that is obviously active. Our humanity is very much akin to this. This, is, this analogy is appropriate in that there are those human cells that are inactive, alive, invigorated, and they are aspiring towards divinity. And this is, this is also tied into the idea of the aura within humanity, that those brighter spots on the planet, those more of on fire with human desire, the desire to serve humanity and with for human need, they are brighter, if you will. And so these brighter points are akin to the brain cells that are active. And then the dormant, non-spiritual segment of our human population are, the, are akin to, the not, again, the non-active brain cells. And so this is something that we can work towards collectively as more people des become desirous of attaining some union with the divine as more seek out these esoteric ideas and these processes to 
make oneself more perfect ultimately. Uh, that this is, this, the science has been available for a long time and this method to perfect the quality of mind, these methods are available to us. Not everyone's going to want to avail themselves of them, seek them out or be even be aware of them, but uh, they are available for us. Um, this is just, it's something that's going to have to take place on a case-by-case -case basis as to who decides they want to partake of these mysteries and uh, subject themselves to these trials by fire. This is another term that uh, is, has a lot of esoteric connotations. And so again, trial by fire, burning out the, the uh, undesirable aspects. Getting back to the idea of hierarchy, those that guide behind the scenes, this esteemed group, this group of the just men made perfect, have, again, this a more comprehensive understanding of the will nature of humanity by virtue of having put this process into effect. And so their outlook is, again, much more perfect and more complete than ours. And so as we learn to seek, um, seek instruction and uh, find information regarding the teachings of this, this group and how they interact with humanity, we can see ideas playing out. And these, this, again, this group is also charged with being a custodian to ideas unfolding and emerging within our humanity. And certainly when there is a new idea emerging, a new scientific discovery, uh, new ideas in education, um, new governmental concepts, new concepts in, in the terms of finance and uh, monetary policy, things of that nature, we're going to see that there are going to be certain individuals that are going to uh, be proponents of these ideas. They're, they're going to bring them out to humanity. As to where these ideas originated is the question. The level of cause and effect, again, is the level of mind. As a thought emerges, and finds its way into more receptive minds, it can eventually take root and become an ideal and then an accepted philosophy, an accepted way of life. This takes time. Uh, certainly there are going to be receptive individuals of all various uh, inclinations, whether you want to term them good or evil. And so even the person that would be very materialistic and self-centered, the sun shines on everyone alike. And so these energetic influences are going to also affect individuals that don't necessarily have humanity's best interest at heart. And so again, as these extra cosmic influences and the planetary influences and qualities of karma and a, and a vast array of energies come together converge and interact, then ideas also fracture from that and play out from that. And so this, there, this is currently, in this day and age, there is an idea war, an information war, and this is, this is the real testing ground or battleground is the, is the plane of mind. Now certainly it seems as if, from many levels, that those that seek to enslave humanity are controlling conditions and that they seem to have the upper hand. This is again because they work from the plane of emotion, the desire nature of humanity. And, and so since we as humanity are primarily still, we're very largely emotionally centered, we're very largely centered in our desire nature, this is the path of least resistance and this is the way in which a handful of strongly minded dark magicians can manipulate the bulk of humanity through uh, programs of propaganda uh, and various means to hypnotize and traumatize, terrorize our population. Uh, fear is the main means of doing this. Fear keeps us separated, it keeps us isolated, and it keeps us constantly in a state of anxiety and unrest and uneasiness. If we're constantly fearful, then the calm conditions that we need to enact the science of mind, you know, this firm and fertile ground with which we need, that we need in order to plant the proper seeds and have, again, the, the
the proper nurturing conditions to progress with our evolutionary consciousness in a positive manner won't be provided for us. If we have, again, disruption, turmoil, and we're constantly in fear of where we're going to find our next meal, uh, if we're, gonna, we're constantly in fear of you know, keeping and maintaining our employment, things of this nature, uh, these are large distractions for us. And this is a program that's uh, part of our civilization in that the ideas uh, that keep us enslaved are, are ritualized and they've been in, in action and in, uh, in this process of unfolding for a long time. So this counterbalance to this material nature is based on, again, the emerging idea of the fire of the mind in relation to the emerging nature of the fire of the heart. And there is teaching related, teaching related to the doctrine of the heart that has been made available to our humanity as well that is, is it's, a, it's a really powerful teaching and it's a, a very powerful and potent teaching that again the doctrine of the heart, it gets right to the heart of the matter of how to have a greater, more, again, a more potent and, and a, 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 a realer, a more real relation with the divine, with our will nature. And so this, uh, this fiery nature of ours is, does emerge through our application of these sciences. The fire of the heart the doctrine of the heart, again, this, the fire of the heart has to merge with the fire of the mind. The desire nature has to be inverted, if you will. And we can consider the idea of the heart inverted and so that the point at the bottom of the heart is rotated so that it's up, that it looks more like a spade. But that point, that one-pointed heart approach is our aspiration turned away from the material desire nature, mo uh, pointed upwards to the will nature. And so this desire, this fire of desire, this aspirational nature is shifted towards things of the divine. And this is um, also, when we think of the heart in relation to the organs in the physical body, we can also think of the correspondence between the sun and that the sun is akin to the heart in the human body, and it is the means by which light is moved and processed uh, in the solar system. The various planets are like the organs in the body. And so this sun, the, the sun, the nature of the sun and the nature of the heart are very similar. And as quantum ideas become more comprehensive and they factor in more and more the unseen nature of our humanity, then there will be a, an understanding through these quantum ideas and quantum science, quantum mechanics, of a point between our heart and a point what, uh, within the sun. Now certainly we see the face of the sun, the physical face of the sun, looks like a fiery ball, uh, but esoteric science factors in that there are other inner aspects of the sun, just in the sense that you look at the, you can point to the dense physical vehicle you, that you see in front of you, and you see that there's a person, but this doesn't give you any insight into there's an inner emotional nature, an inner mental working out, a soul and a spirit contained in and hidden within the outer portion that we're familiar with. And so there's a personality of the sun, if you will, that is the globe that we see and all of its flares and sunspots and things of that nature. And then there is the inner aspect of the sun that is not readily available to the physical eye, but is tied into the magnetic rapport that we feel within our hearts. We, in, uh, within our heart nature, we have a magnetic rapport that connects us to all other life. The very seeds for life itself are held within the blood, and so the blood is the life, and the, the seat of that life is essentially in the heart nature, is tied to the heart nature. And so the life seed 
for the solar system is also tied into our sun. And th there's a, a, a magnetic rapport between the sun and the planets. And this magnetic rapport is very much akin to the magnetic rapport that we feel within our heart that again connects us to all other hearts of all other human beings on the planet. If we open up our heart, we can instantly, as soon as we do this, I mean, it's, it's instant, it's automatic. As soon as we open up our hearts to another individual, uh, in, irrespective of distance, we instantly are in tune heart to heart with that person. And we can allow ourselves to think of a friend that's, maybe we have a loved one in Iraq, for instance. We can instantly open our hearts and send out an energetic current to that person directly heart to heart. And then this, uh, this desire nature, this, this aspirational nature is enacted or, or fired up, if you will, by this process. And so this is, this is also uh, when the energetic nature of our body is factored in as well, then we consider the energy nature, our etheric body, is also like a sea of fire underlying all humanity and all life in manifestation. And so the self-conscious fire underlying and uh, basically interwoven within our etheric nature is very much part of the what the uh, embryonic seeds of what will allow us to be telepathic as a race. And so as future unfolding of mind through our human condition perfects itself, we'll find that we'll be able to use the heart and the head. And so our fire of mind will be united and merged in a unique way with the fire of the heart. And this condition is very, um, this is a condition that is seen in someone that is sometimes referred to as a world servant or someone who is completely on fire with the desire to serve their fellow man and to serve and uplift humanity. And so this, this merging is, uh, there are a lot of merging, there are a lot of uh, analogies that we can bring or make to this idea of the fire of mind merging with the fire of heart and this fusion, this, this united merging of energies is, is very much a fusion. And so just in the sense of a fusion on the physical plane at the atomic level, there is a tremendous amount of energy released. And this, again, relates us as humanity to the, uh, the enacted, enlivened brain cell, the non-dormant uh, the non-dormant life cell, excuse me, brain cell. And so uh, this, this again is a key component that will tie us into our unfolding as a race. There is an idea esoterically that our planet, planet Earth, will take on an entirely new condition. And as to how soon this will unfold, it depends on humanity to a large degree, that we have the capacity to enact our wills and to use the science uh, that's available to us to create the proper circumstances for the consciousness of the globe, of the planet itself and our human consciousness in conjunction with the lesser kingdoms in nature to form a unique new bond and to allow for the consciousness of the globe to take on a more exalted role in relation to it, his, uh, his brothers in the solar system. So there are other planets, for instance, we spoke earlier of the relationship between Venus and the Earth. Venus being like the, the soul to our Earth, and the Earth being like this, the personality nature. And so Venus has already become a so-called sacred planet, as have other planets in the solar system. And this is uh, akin to a person you know, taking a, becoming a doctor, having a doctor's degree, or uh, you know, becoming knighted, perhaps, or something like that. You know, some, I'm trying to find some proper uh, analogy, but this this exalted condition is something that uh, is gained again by the consciousness of a planet. So, expansion of the quality of mind 
throughout self-conscious and aware and sentient, sentient being is not just a human condition. Certainly on this planet, we as humanity have this mind moving through us and unfolding through us, but the quality of mind also is unfolding at a much higher level through much more divine components of the universe than just our, our human selves. And so uh, this is a point to keep in mind as well. We're all, all self-conscious entities are moving towards a greater unfolding of, of mind uh, and coming to a collective state of mental perfection, relatively speaking, within the context of this uh, universe that's unfolding. And so uh, that's, that's still in the process of manifesting. Um, the idea that, uh, again, there's this idea of receptivity, that certain individuals are going to be more receptive to these ideas. Now, certain, again, certain ideas um, are, are, going, are going to find their way into manifestation because there are going to be those individuals that are going to be very receptive and they're already going to be in tune with this way of thinking. And so if they're some financial whiz kid or something like that and they, they come up with this new idea, they're already, uh, by virtue of karmic links and things like that, they're already predisposed to ideas of finance. So when this precipitation of ideas makes its way into uh, our human conscious awareness, our, um, the collective consciousness, then certain people are going to gravitate towards it. And so this is the way in which the hierarchy, so-called, implants ideas into our human condition. It's a two-fold process in that it's much like rain precipitating down. The rain is going to fall down on all the individuals, but some are going to be more receptive, and some are going to take in that nourishment and that nurturing and embody this, this condition and, and uh, embellish from this precipitation more so. Um, others are going to, again, be already somewhat predisposed towards this, whether that be science, government, religion, they're already wired, if you will, for these concepts or this, this calling, this, uh, um, this field, this field of, of endeavor. Again, whether that's scientific, religious, educational, the social services, arts and humanities, they're already hardwired, they're already an artist, they're already a scientist, they're already a healer. And so these ideas that are, again, broadcast out, if you will, the hierarchy are like a radio station in a sense, and that they broadcast out an aspect of the plan, the plan so-called for the unfolding of the will within the context of our human nature. So just as Christ in the Gospel narratives demonstrated by merging His will with the Father, becoming one with the Father, we also can make progress in that direction by contemplating the nature of the will of God and contemplating our what, contemplating what we can, because everybody can apprehend some portion of this plan, some portion of the purpose of the will and expression on the planet. Everyone can gain and, and gravitate towards some component of it, some more thoroughly and inclusively than others. Some people are going to be able to really grasp the full comprehensive nature of the plan more so than others. And so this is all, uh, you know, again, we're all uh, able to, to gather this in. Just some are going to be already more hardwired, pre-wired, or predisposed to these concepts. And so they'll be a readily they'll be more like fertile ground for these seeds to find a place to, to grow and, and flourish. And so, uh, <clears throat> again, these ideas made manifest within human consciousness. Some take root. The proper humans find these ideas and they take them and run with them. And they may form an institution. They may form an organization. They may form, again, a scientific hypothesis based on this precipitation of ideas, this, this broadcast of energy of the plan, so-called. And so as we're able to apprehend our particular apportioned piece of the plan, we can bring it through into manifestation and unfold something of rare beauty. So this is up to us. Everyone 
can expand their capacity of mind and allow mind to work through us. Um, some choose to let other people think for them. I think that's the biggest travi travesty that there is on the planet, quite frankly, is that people oftentimes are not willing to think for themselves. They allow the box to do the thinking for them. Uh, they allow the programmers to program them without really without really thinking these things through critically. And that's a, a great travesty in my estimation. Um, again, this, this idea of fire emerging in mankind is something that we can study and we can, uh, we can begin to practice if we so choose. Uh, not everybody is interested in meditation. The Agni Yoga, so-called, the, fi the, fire, the uh, yoga of fire and synthesis, is essentially a meditation. This is a means by which we, again, build this bridge of fire by sitting in a calm fashion, quietly, contemplating, and purposefully uniting our will with the greater will. This is, uh, again, an unfolding aspect of yoga that's really yet to take root in a great numbers on the planet, but still, the fact that the older yogas are so widely known, the Hatha Yoga, Bhakti Yoga, uh, a number of these others are so prevalent is just a future, is an indication of the future in relation to some of these other yogas, in particular, Araja Yoga, which is also known as the kingly science of the soul. This is also a, a means of union. And then there are, again, the union of the, the uh, yoga of synthesis and fire, Agni Yoga. These uh, continue to merge. And also our understanding of the nature, the inner nature of the sun as it ties into life and the circulation of life and the circulation of life throughout the individual body how these correspond and tie together. These mysteries are becoming more and more accessible and uh, science will make great discoveries in the near future that will corroborate a lot of these concepts. And the science already is uh, really proving a lot of that. I guess that's it.